In this YouTube video, we'll take a look at the late Mark Fisher's book, Ghosts of My Life, and the utopian potential of the Star Wars franchise. In Mark Fisher's book, he explained what he calls this slow cancellation of the future by referring to the final episode of the early 80s ITV science fiction program, Sapphire and Steel. The show presents the stories of six assignments of two interdimensional operatives, the titular characters, Sapphire and Steel. The premise of the program was that the progress of time could easily be interrupted. In the world of Sapphire and Steel, the past always threatened to overtake the present as time, itself a malignant and irrational being, looked for weaknesses in the corridors of history where it might break in and cause regression and repetition. The task of agents Sapphire and Steel was to keep time moving forward, to champion progress, and to facilitate the creation of the future. Fisher's idea is the 21st century is very much the same as the timeless cafe Sapphire and Steel found themselves in during their final assignment. Are you going to show more surprise than your friend? Time might have moved forward during the 20th century. We took steps from ocean liners to airplanes, from radio to television, from jazz and blues to rock and roll. But then, sometime in the late 80s or early 90s, the past broke in and colonized the present while exterminating the future. Whatever's happened to us, it can't be a crime, can it? No. Fisher explains what has happened as a slow cancellation of the future. That is, the time that contains our lives has slowly become aimless and undifferentiated. This has had strange effects. While we used to recreate the past in order to understand it or relive it, today we recreate the past unconsciously. Today's nostalgia is purely formal. Today's nostalgia takes up the signs and forms of yesterday's culture, not in tribute or as a critique, but in the same way that workers reproduce their own exploitation every day in order to survive. We repeat the past simply because these are the only forms that seem remotely viable. I just thought we all might have a good time, you know? Consider the difference between the George Lucas film American Graffiti and the George Lucas film Star Wars. Both are in some sense nostalgic, but when Roger Ebert reviewed American Graffiti, he described the film as something that served to remind him of the passage of time and of the changes that had taken place in society, whereas he wrote that Star Wars transported him to another world entirely. When I went to see American Graffiti, that whole world, a world that now seems so incomparably distant and innocent, was brought back with a rush of feeling that wasn't so much nostalgic as a culture shock. Remembering my high school generation, I can only wonder at how unprepared we were for the loss of innocence that took place in America with a series of hammer blows, beginning with the assassination of President Kennedy. Well, after Star Wars, he wrote, Every once in a while, I have what I think of as an out-of-body experience at the movies. When the ESP people use a phrase like that, they're referring to the sensation of the mind actually leaving the body and spiriting itself off to China or Peoria or a galaxy far, far away. When I use the phrase, I simply mean that my imagination has forgotten it is actually present in a movie theater and thinks it's up there on the screen. In a curious sense, the events in the movie seem real, and I seem to be a part of them. Star Wars taps the pulp fantasies buried in our memories, and because it's done so brilliantly, it reactivates old thrills, fears, and exhilarations we thought we'd abandon when we read our last copy of Amazing Stories. The difference here is between being given a nostalgic shock that brought Ebert into history and his experience of Star Wars in a nostalgic mode. This experience of Star Wars as timeless 
was not merely documented by Ebert's review, but theorized by Frederick Jameson. In Postmodernism and Consumer Society, he wrote, One of the most important cultural experiences of the generations that grew up from the 1930s to the 1950s was a Saturday afternoon series of the Buck Rogers type. Alien villains, true American heroes, heroines in distress, the death ray or the doomsday box, and the cliffhanger at the end, whose miraculous solution was to be witnessed next Saturday afternoon. Star Wars reinvents this experience in the form of a pastiche. Far from being a pointless satire of such dead forms, Star Wars satisfies a deep, might I even say repressed, longing to experience them again. It was a complex object in which, on some first level, children and adolescents can take the adventures straight, while the adult public is able to gratify a deeper and more properly nostalgic desire to return to that older period and to live its strange old ascetic artifacts through once again. In his book, Ghosts of My Life, Mark Fisher comments, he says, quote, belying its origin in these fusty adventure series forms, Star Wars could appear new because its then unprecedented special effects relied upon the latest technology. By comparison, the band Kraftwerk used technology to allow new forms to emerge, while works in the nostalgic mode subordinate or subordinated technology to the task of refurbishing the old. For Bernardi, the slow cancellation of the future uh, clearly is not just a cultural thing, it's also a political thing, and of course the, 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 the sense of the disappearance of a political future, the sense of uh, a, uh, a future which um, would be radically different in political terms from today is, is also part of this. However, the problem we're facing is not that we're obsessed with the past, or that we have a tendency to romanticize the past. In fact, According to Fisher, a return to the past is in order. What holds back such a retro move, however, is our capitalist realism, or the pervasive belief in a perpetual present, a frozen moment, wherein what is now is all that can be. The School of Materialist Research is a self-sustainable platform where ideas are discussed in ways that would not be possible in conventional academia. The school is defined by its interest in the materialist approach to knowledge. Among its faculty are Julia Kristeva, Amanda Beach, Ben Woodward, Thomas Nail, and Paul Cockshot. The deadline for applications is September 4th, 2023. Check out the link to the School of Materialist Research in the description for this video. What Fisher called capitalist realism and Jameson called the cultural logic of late capitalism might also be called postmodernism. And the latent argument in both Jameson and Fisher's work is this. By losing our notions of universality, transcendence, and ultimately the notion of the real, we have also lost our ability to change. Under capitalism, social relations are mediated by things, and people are put into service of these things. All of life revolves around the maintenance and reproduction of these social objects called commodities. The ultimate outcome of this way of life is that our very self-understanding, the entire history of our relationship to the world, is itself transformed into a commodity. And the more developed and domineering capitalism becomes, the more other forms of authority are undermined and absorbed. It's worth noting that as much as Fisher decries the end of history at the death of the future, he gives this tendency to destroy the future a historical designation. Postmodernity, capitalist realism, the culture of late capitalism, all of these are also known as neoliberal or neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is an historical phase. It's an historical phase in our political economy. It's what came after Fordism. It was brought about by changing conditions in profitability, production, communication technology, and so on. 
if we can fit even the death of history into historical time, if we can understand this new atemporality as arising out of history, can we really say that history has ended? The historical dynamic of capitalism ceaselessly generates what is new while regenerating what is the same. This dynamic both generates the possibility of another organization of social life and yet hinders that possibility from being realized. Marx grasps this very complex historical dynamic with his category of capital. The historically specific abstract form of social domination intrinsic to capitalism then is the domination of people by time.